While we sing and work, you are always with us, great Stalin. Great Stalin, you guide and encourage us. Your thoughts make our hearts much stronger. We sing to you, great Stalin, to thank you and the party. Nothing will interfere with our enjoyment of being creative. And victoriously, we gather more crops. The second Soviet occupation under Stalin's son continued into its sixth year. Farmers were forced to join collective farms and they realized that nothing could save Estonian agriculture from total ruin. The development of large industries continued at full pace and the necessary labor was brought in from the east. Russification intensified after the eighth plenum of the Central Committee of the Estonian Communist Party in March 1950. The Soviet system stood firmly on its feet. The terror didn't stop after the mass deportations of 1949. Army units were given the task of combing the forests. During the period from 1951 to 1954, resistance groups were eliminated. It looked as though Comrade Stalin would live forever. The task before our people is to create, through selfless socialist labor, a concrete basis for the complete rebuilding of communism in our country. Estonians are carrying out this great historical task in firm and brotherly cooperation with all the Soviet nationalities. Under the guidance of the Soviet system, the great Bolshevik party, and our leader and teacher, Comrade Stalin. Stalin's name symbolizes victory and a bright future. On the occasion of the 70th birthday of Comrade Stalin, the best friend of the Estonian people, Viru Square, has been renamed Stalin Square. The square will be the center of the capital of Soviet Estonia. This will be the site for impressive multi-storied modern buildings like the one housing the Estonian ministries, the city's executive committee building, and the headquarters of the Estonian Oil Shale Trust. Here we will proudly erect the victory monument which will symbolize both the greatness of the Stalinist era and our love for dear Stalin. A Kremlin power struggle also affected Tallinn. In March 1950, Tallinn was the venue for the seventh plenum of the Central Committee of the Estonian Communist Party. The proceedings of the plenum were kept secret. For me, you could say that 1950 began early. In the fall of 1949, the heads of all local institutions in Tartu were replaced by Estonians from Russia or Russians. Afterwards, I reached the conclusion that this was part of an attempt to create a uniform Soviet people. Estonian managers were given the boot, and everything had to be done in Russian. I was one of the last ones in Tartu to be fired. I had been the director of the official archives. The prices of food and manufactured goods have once again been reduced by decree of the cabinet of the USSR and the Central Committee of the Communist Bolshevik Party. This new reduction in prices is an example of the Stalinist care shown by the Soviet government and the Bolshevik Party for the well-being of the workers. The price reductions will enable the people to save 110 billion rubles. The wide masses of workers can now afford goods that were luxury items in bourgeois Estonia. The Yuriye Kolhoz in the district of Harku, just as everywhere else in our large homeland, the proclamation concerning new government bonds was received with great joy. 
Bonds are being bought on a massive basis, a demonstrative expression of Soviet patriotism. More than 27 billion rubles worth of government bonds were bought during a period of five days to help rebuild and develop the Soviet national economy. All power went into the hands of Russian Estonians who were headed by party leader Ivan, later Johannes Kabin. The communists of pre-war Estonia and the June communists were pushed aside. The audience is concentrating on the speech by the first secretary of the Central Committee of the Estonian Communist Bolshevik Party, Comrade Gabin, about the glorious achievements that the Estonian people have attained during the ten years that they have been guided by the great Stalin. The letter of the Estonian people to our great friend, father and teacher, dear Comrade Stalin, is read by People's Deputy Mürsep. The letter is acclaimed with tempestuous applause. The unveiling of Stalin's monument, the impressive statue of our beloved leader, rises before the eyes of the masses. Stalin is inseparably connected to the progressive forces of mankind through his hopes and dreams for a lasting peace and for the happiness of workers. Lasnana is filled with masses of people like a huge blooming meadow, like a sparkling, surging sea. This is where Estonians, Russians, Tajiks and Latvians meet. This is where progressive workers meet proud collective farmers. Composer Gustav Ernesax, awardee of the Stalin Prize, steps onto the conductor's platform before the huge choir. In songs and in work, you are always with us, great Stalin. Great Stalin, you guide and encourage us. Your thoughts make our hearts much stronger. We sing to you, great Stalin, to thank you and the party. Nothing will ruin our joy of creating. Victoriously, we gather more crops. Comrades, workers of the Tallinn machinery plant, I nominate Josef Isarionovich Stalin, our beloved leader and teacher, the Estonian people's liberator from capitalist enslavement, as the people's candidate in the 33rd electoral district of the Council of Deputies of the Working People of Tallinn. Hurrah to the great Stalin! Pupils of the 7th grade in Tallinn secondary school are getting prepared for civics class. The Soviet Union is the first nation in the world where power is in the hands of the workers. It is, like Comrade Stalin says, a totally new, unprecedented state, a new, higher type of state. It is a new kind of state in the sense that in our state there is no exploitation of man. Therefore, it is obvious that the Soviet state is in fact the most democratic state in the whole world. No system has ever been so close to and so concerned with the people. The Estonian coast was closely guarded and sealed off with barbed wire and a plowed up strip of land. But conditions in fishing collectives were better than in collective farms. Boats were kept under lock and key and the catch went to the authorities but a little something also trickled down to the fishermen. After 10 in the evening, we weren't allowed to go to the seashore. At night, lights were shined in our windows. I don't know whether they were trying to scare us or what. We were allowed to go out to sea only with the permission of the border guards. This permission was only given during certain hours. We weren't allowed to do anything if the time wasn't deemed to be right. I don't know where they had seen ski tracks, but since I skied a lot, they came after me and took me to their headquarters. But those weren't my tracks, since I only skied in the vicinity of my home. I 
There was a good road to the shore, but we weren't allowed to go there. Border guards watched all access routes to the sea, but they didn't have searchlights everywhere. They couldn't close off the coast completely. Because the shore wasn't mined, they tried to keep it plowed, but it was too big of a task, and they were unable to stick to it. Still, there were periods when very many sectors were plowed. I'm a local boy, and I know every rock on the seashore. We didn't depart from a section patrolled by the border guard. We left instead from a place where there was a torpedo training area. World War II scattered Estonians to both the east and the west. There were about 20 million displaced persons in Europe. There were 50,000 refugees in Germany and about 20,000 in Sweden. They set up organizations and schools to help preserve the culture. In 1947, the refugees began to be resettled by international aid organizations. During a period of five years, 30,000 Estonians emigrated to the USA, Canada, and Australia. Usually, the Western countries didn't hand over Baltic refugees to the communists, but there were occasions when this took place with Ukrainians, Russians, and Cossacks. Forced repatriation was feared like death itself. The party in the KGB tried to lure refugees to return home. They even published a newspaper called Return to the Homeland. Propaganda broadcasts were also made. Respected prominent people were pressured into turning out propaganda to try to influence refugees to return home. Is it better to be a chip of wood blown about by the wind or to dedicate yourself to your homeland and people? The homeland's pastures and coasts, workshops and factories, mines and schools are open to all honest returning Estonians. The homeland will provide lodging and work. Dear compatriots, end your senseless and miserable existence abroad. The homeland beckons. Welcome to the homeland to Soviet Estonia. Let's start going, fellas. Our homes await. A few men with pale faces were sitting in the cell. Where did you come from? How? Hasn't the war begun yet? It was strange. I had an argument with them in Vasalema prison. These gentlemen truly believed that war was just about to break out, that they had to hang on just a little bit longer. They believed that the Americans would come to help us. This kind of psychosis was the determining factor in making the decision to stay here and wait. Otherwise, some would have tried to escape. But they were great guys anyway. For example, there were Bernhard Linde and Ewald Kulm, who before the war was a bus driver for the Tallinn YMCA and drove to Paris. They were both tall and the ceiling was low. They couldn't stand up straight. Even I, when careless, hit my head against the ceiling. Linda Allesar, the best writer of Leninist essays, does her work with love. Soviet culture had to be nationalist in form and socialist in content. The socialist content was shrill Stalinist party propaganda, the nationalist form blatant Russification. Other than political literature, only 38 Estonian novels appeared in print in four years, but 45 Russian translations were published. Estonian composers and actors visited the Volta factory. Meeting you inspires us enthusiastically to create new works that interpret the lives of the heroic Soviet people, our glorious party, and its leader, Comrade Stalin. This meeting between composers and industrial workers is a useful and essential event. We wish that there were more such meetings. 
We also wish that there were more artistic works dealing with the lives and endeavors of the workers. The pressure applied in literature, music, art and science was part of the struggle against bourgeois nationalism. Some intellectuals participated, but not all. The choral singing and song festival traditions continued. The fine arts were given a high priority since they served propagandistic purposes. Some intellectuals were taken advantage of and bribed with various privileges. Stalin firmly carries the flag, he is the one we love. He gives a vow to all nations, the war will not begin. I was the director of a collective farm in 1951. We were very productive and had a large herd of cattle. We needed a security guard, but we were informed that the official quota for security guards had been filled. The Estonian State Planning Committee was powerless. They had to ask Moscow to increase the security guard quota. Finally, a written response came from Moscow stating permission granted to hire one extra security guard in the Estonian SSR. He was assigned to us, and it bore Stalin's signature. It was, of course, a stamped signature, not a personal one. I went home and shook old Josep Kempi's hand and said to him, Well done. Now do your duty. You have been personally assigned by Comrade Stalin. On March 5, 1953, the heart of the genius of humanity, the mind and heart of millions of workers, our wise and beloved leader, the great Stalin, stopped. His death brought sincere tears to the eyes of millions of Soviet people. On the streets of Moscow, mourning crowds trampled 400 people to death while bidding Stalin farewell. But Estonians had to try to conceal their joy. They hoped that things would change after the tyrant's death. Party leaders in the Kremlin began to divide up power, Beria, Malenkov, Khrushchev. The most powerful was the head of the secret police, Marshal Lavrenti Pavlovich Beria, who became the head of the Ministry of Internal Affairs and the Ministry of Security. People feared the worst from Beria, since he symbolized repression. Actually, it was he who had the best understanding of what was really going on. To increase the Red Empire's control over border areas, he tried to promote local ethnic personnel. Local Estonians could now function in the Soviet system. The strict border control was relaxed. On June 26th, Beria was arrested by his comrades in arms. On the day of Stalin's funeral, we were working in the forest. At 12 noon, we were to mourn with five minutes of silence. We were ordered to take off our caps. Beside me stood a former officer of Vlasov's army. He was fed up with the Soviets, and he told the guard to screw off. He refused to take his cap off. We had to lie down as shots rang out. The Tallinn Kalinin locomotive repair shop. The general meeting of the shop workers collective joined unanimously with all enraged Soviet workers in condemning the activities of the trader Beria and his conspirators. The Rakvere tractor depot was the first one in our republic to publish its own newspaper. This Bolshevik paper deals with all questions that interest collective farmers. Everyone must be ready to lend a hand on the large fields of the expanded collective farms. When massive collectivization began in 1949, that first year, and also 1950, ended quite well. This is interesting. 
Even 1951 was not so bad, but 1952 was catastrophic. 1953 was a little better when Khrushchev came to power after Stalin's death. Then the September plenum was held, where they actually began to think about ordinary people. During the noon break, a concert is presented right in the fields. Agriculture was a part of party policy, not an economic endeavor, and run by the political departments of the tractor depots. The search for kulaks continued. Agricultural production fell off. Collective farmers survived thanks to their garden plots and cows. For the first time, the best brigade of the Kolhoz uses the new hand seeder. The first agricultural reforms were carried out in September 1953. State purchasing prices were raised and the state quotas and taxes were lowered. Even so, most of the reforms failed, for they hadn't been thought through, such as new but unsuitable means for growing potatoes, the compulsory planting of corn despite Estonia's unsuitable climate and soil, and the growing of sunflowers and dandelions for the production of latex. In industry, a piecework system was adopted. Men began to hustle because now they could earn three times more. Many became sick from working too hard. Most of the men worked in the mines for a reason, simply because they couldn't find work elsewhere. This year, a new cultural center was opened in the mining town of Kohtlanumme. Lots of miners came to see how their co-workers perform favorite folk dances. And then the building of a new socialist city began. They said that a new big city was to be built. Our men worked on the project on the weekends out of their free time. As it turned out, Estonians couldn't live there. Russians were brought in instead. The former Estonian residents weren't allowed to return to Narva. The immigrant workers turned Narva into a Russian town. A new beautiful city replaces war ruins. It is 1956. The economic reforms provided a sharp contrast to the previous severe political pressure. Mass terror, no longer deemed appropriate, was replaced by liberalization, rehabilitations and amnesties, initially for criminals. In 1954, surviving Estonians began to return from the distant parts of the Soviet Union that they had been deported to. The 20th Party Congress condemned Stalin's crimes. This wasn't due to Khrushchev, but to the new political climate. Thanks to Khrushchev, our intelligentsia was freed from the prison camps. Eighty percent of the imprisoned Estonians were freed, those who had been in the German army and the Home Guard. But some of us remained imprisoned for years to come. The former inmates of the camps had a desire to work when they returned home. They were starving for work. Khrushchev's thaw began with the 20th Congress. The Soviet system no longer used mass terror and avoided direct confrontations with the West. Hungary became the symbol of liberalization and democratization in the socialist camp. Imre Nash, a communist idealist, was head of state. He wanted to develop socialism with a human face by legal means. The Budapest uprising began on October 23, 1956. The government promised sweeping reforms and declared Hungary to be a neutral state. On November 4th, the Fraternal Red Army attacked Hungary. Hungarian civilians and soldiers defended Budapest for 49 days. Tens of thousands were killed and the city was destroyed. Ten thousand five hundred Estonian deportees and political prisoners came home. The USSR was now a state with a double standard. Till then, the Soviets had openly used overt terror for ideological and political reasons. Now the repressions were carried out secretly. The MGB, the Ministry of Security, became the Security Committee, or KGB, in 1954.
Officially, it answered to the Council of Ministries. Gavin's team stayed in power. Ideological change was very slow. But the forbidden poetry of Maria Under and Gustav Suits was now published. The Western states, who were preoccupied with the Suez crisis, didn't react to Hungary's desperate cry for help. Hungary lost its fight for freedom, and with that died all hopes for the liberalization and democratization of socialism. Those were the brutal weeks of broken illusions. The 20th Party Congress awakened great hopes, but these died with the events of October and November 1956 in Hungary. Everyone could see that the Soviet system hadn't really changed and that the attitude of the West about defending democracy and freedom had not changed either.